Well, hello, hello. So, hello. I know it's been a minute. I'm Pastor Garland Price with Common Ground Ministry. So, shout out to my husband, my lamb chop, a.k.a. Pastor Marvin Price Jr. I love him. He's such a sweet lamb. So, anyway, I wanted to share this with you about a week ago or a couple weeks ago when God gave me revelation of it. But he didn't really tell me to share it, so I didn't, right? So, but I want to share with you today that God has sent you ahead, right? God has sent you ahead of so many people and so many things that... Um, you will understand by and by, right? You know how old church people say by and by, right? We'll understand. And so what does that mean? God has sent you ahead. And so I happen to be reading, I think it was in the book of Psalms. So it was Psalm 105, 17, right? I'm going to read that scripture before, um, for you. But I just want to share with you, and this is a rhetorical question. This is not a question I expect you to say, yeah, that's me. But of course, you're going to probably say, yeah, that's me, right? And so the question is, have you ever wondered, Lord, why me? Like, why do I have to go through this? Why am I going through these things? What is the purpose? What's your plan? What's it all for? And yet at the time, we don't necessarily see the unfolding of it, right? Because God, when God gives us a vision, like and we're going to talk about Joseph and how people say Joseph was a dreamer, but Joseph was given a vision or a dream by God, but he was only given a synopsis, right? And so when he was given that synopsis and he decided to go share it with non-dreamers and with non-visionaries, they hated him all the more and they plotted to kill him. I'm going to read that to you in Genesis, right? So a lot of times when God gives you a vision or gives you clarity about something and it's only in part, you don't want to go sharing it with the world, even if you see it in full, even if you know it in whole and you like, God gave me the entire blueprint. You don't want to go share it with people because your brothers and sisters may hate you for it, but they don't understand that what God meant for um, what they meant for your bad, God is making it for your good. And really the vision that is yet for an appointed time could be a blessing to them as well, right? Later on, his brothers by and by find that out, right? But the Lord wanted me to share with you on today that you're that, that man or that woman that he sent ahead, that, that man or woman that he sent before. So let me read it to you right quick in Psalms 105, 17. Hopefully I'm not giving the end away, right, at the beginning. But it says in Psalm 105, 17, he called down famine on the land and cut off all their food, all their supplies of food. He sent a man before them, Joseph, sold as a slave. They bruised his feet with shackles and placed his neck in irons. Glory to God. So here it is. It says it again. Well, I don't want to read that part, right? That's when Joseph has a revelation or reveals his revelation, right? So I just want to share with you, and let me see where I want to share with you first. So in Genesis 37, it says, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. And so I won't read through um, verse 2, but let's see where I want to go to. Okay, verse 3. So Genesis 37 and 3. Now Israel... Now let's go back. So I'm going to read the whole thing. Jacob, Genesis 37, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Any of you all ever felt like that? Like your brothers and sisters in Christ, your, the people around you, maybe your very own family. They can't speak a kind word about you or around you. Everybody's situation is different. Everybody's surroundings are different. But people hate you because you're favored, right? And But you maybe you don't even realize that you're favored because you're like, why would they favor me? Why would they be jealous of me? So maybe you're not even innately aware of it, but that doesn't mean that it's not so. So in Genesis 37 and 5, Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, Listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. See, he only saw it in part, right? But then in Genesis 37 and 9, it says, Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. Glory to God. 
when he told his fathers as well as his brothers, his father rebuked them and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. And so here it is. It wasn't that he was talking too much. This is his family. These are his brothers. This is his father. So he may not be aware that they hate him, right? Not his father because he was favorite. But now even his father is like, wait, so you think your mom and I are going to bow down to you like for real? And so here it is that he sees these visions. He knows they have a meaning, right? But now when he begins to share them with people, they hate him all the more. They can't stand him because they're saying I'm not bowing down to like in their mind I'm not bowing down to you I'm not you're not my king you're not going to rule over me you're not going to lord over us right and so here it is when you begin to share your dreams and visions with people and and you begin to go about your life and you're like God why am I going through these things I don't want to get ahead of myself right but they hated him all the more because of the favor that he had and because he had the ability to dream dreams that sent that seemed like they were going to put him above others or put him above them, and they didn't like it. So it says in Genesis 37 and 12, Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, As you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I'm going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, Go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks, and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, What are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They have moved on from there, the man answered. I heard them say, Let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan, but they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. See, people see you in the distance. Glory to God. They see what God has on you in the distance. They see that God has favored you in the distance. They see that, you know, the favor of God is upon your life in the distance. Now, you may be feeling like, not so favorable you may be looking like this is like everyday life you may not realize that you're favored because maybe things don't look like you expect them to look or look like you feel like favor looks but somebody the enemy sees you afar off and now they've plotted to kill you glory to god maybe kill your assess i mean kill your character kill your intention kill your dreams kill your vision right so in 37 genesis 37 19 it says here comes that dreamer they said to each other, come now, let's kill him and throw him to, into one of the cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. See, people don't like it when you have revelation. People don't like it when you have vision. People don't like it when God has given you a dream and a vision to carry out, and especially when it means that, they, that you may lord over them, especially when it means that you may lead them, especially when it means that you may be better than them in their eyes, right? Not in your mind or in your eyes, but in their eyes, oh, you think you're going to be something oh you think we're gonna bow down to you oh you want to have dreams about us and think that you're gonna lord over us well it's not happening right and so now they come like the enemy to steal to kill and to destroy and so here it is they said then we'll see what comes of his dreams so sometimes some too often we talk too much and we tell people things too soon and we tell people too much and of course we can't go back and tell joseph maybe you should have kept it to yourself maybe you should have kept it close to your heart right but even his dad was like Oh, so your mom and I, we're going to bow down to you too. So you've got to use wisdom, right? And discernment to say, maybe I need to keep that close at hand. Maybe I need to be quiet because just because my bestie says, go girl, go guy, doesn't mean they mean go girl, go guy. Just because your sister or your brother or your friends or your family, I'm not saying this is for everybody. I'm just saying just because that person that means a lot to you in your life and it's close to you, you think they're celebrating you on the outside. On the inside, they're really despising you. On the inside, they're really hating the fact that God has favored you. Glory to God is the truth. I know it sounds ugly, but they couldn't have been the only ones, right? So in Psalms 37 and 21, when, when Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, they said. he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So see, one wanted to help him, right? But he's outnumbered, right? So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. So luckily he didn't drown, right? But he probably hurt himself when he hit the bottom, I'm just assuming, right? But they stole his robe. 
that was an ornate robe that was a gift from his father, right? People would begin to try to strip you of things and try to take you of things because they're jealous, right? Begin to strip you of those things, those possessions that you have that maybe were a gift or maybe that God has blessed you with. And people will begin to try to take them from you because they're jealous. Glory to God. So in Genesis 37 and 25, as they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay, hand, not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother. Aren't they so kind? Our own flesh and blood, his brothers all agreed. So here it is, they decided not to kill him. They've decided to sell him off into slavery. But in Psalm 105, 17, it says he sent a man before you. I want to read it one more time. He said, he called down famine on the land and cut off all their supplies of food. He sent a man before them, Joseph, sold as a slave. They bruised his feet with shackles and placed his neck in iron. So if his feet were bruised and his neck was in shackles, he had to be in some pain, right? And so here it is, you wonder, well, Lord, why me? God, why me? Why do I, why do I have to go through? Why do I have to go through these things? Why why do I have to feel enslaved? Why do I have to feel like I'm losing everything? Why is all hell breaking loose around me? Because he said I have to send you before them. Because there's going to be a terrible famine in the land. And so like Joseph, you had to be sent out ahead of some things. Glory to God, you had to send out, be sent out beforehand to prepare the way. But we're going to keep going. I'm trying to hurry because I got to run errands with my babies, right? So in Genesis 37, 28, so when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels, 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes because, see, he was trying to save him. So he thought that he could go back later on and get his brother out, but his brother had already been pulled out and sold into slavery. So he went back to his brothers and said, the boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? Now, mind you, when he's sold into slavery, he's only 17 years old. When he's thrown in the cistern by his very own family members, he's only 17. So you wonder, well, gosh, you know, why have you spent your whole life going through things? And why have you spent your whole life feeling like you're fighting to get ahead and fighting to move forward? Because the Lord said he sent a man before you, right? I'm going to read it one more time. Psalm 105, 17. He called down famine on the land and cut off all their supplies of food. He sent a man before them. Joseph sold as a slave. They bruised his feet with shackles and placed his neck in irons. So you're going to go through some things. You're going to be enslaved by some things before you make it to the revelation of what God will have you to do and where God has you going. Glory to God. He said, the boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? Genesis 37 and 31. Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, we found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. So now they're lying. They've sold their brother off for 20 shekels of silver. It's a mess, right? He recognized it and said, it is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. So then Joseph, so then Jacob, I'm sorry, Genesis 37, 34. So then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. So God positioned Joseph to be sold where he would end up with one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. There's a purpose and there's a plan as to why you're being sent out and why you're being sent ahead. What is the revelation of it? Glory to God. So here it is. Of course, we know that Joseph goes to jail, right? Because Potiphar's wife tries to come on to Joseph. He's very handsome. He's very statuesque. And so when she tries to come on to him, he turns down her advances. She steals his cloak. She shows up to her husband. And then all of a sudden, Potiphar believes that Joseph has tried to have relations with his wife. And so he has him thrown into jail. So in Genesis 40, we're skipping ahead, right? Sometime later, Pharaoh's chief cupbearer and chief baker offended their royal master. Pharaoh became angry with these two officials and he put them in the prison where Joseph was and in the palace of the captain guard. They remained in prison for quite some time, and the captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph who looked after him. Even in prison, Joseph was a leader. 
right? Even in prison, Joseph was over the other prisoners. Now here, these two came out of the house of Pharaoh. They came out of the palace. And now all of a sudden, they're under the guard of Joseph, who's not even an Egyptian. Glory to God. So it says in Genesis 40 and 5, while they were in prison, Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker each had a dream one night, and each dream had its own meaning. When Joseph saw them the next morning, he noticed that they both looked upset. Why do you look so worried today, he asked them. Wasn't he kind? Right here it is. He's in prison like they're in prison. And even though he's over them, he's inclined to ask what's wrong. Right? Glory to God. So he had compassion. Unlike the compassion that was not shown to him when he was thrown in the cistern, sold into slavery, um, bruised, his feet were bruised, his neck was an iron. And now here it is for some time he's been in jail. It says, and they replied in Genesis 40 and 8, and they replied, we both had dreams last night, but no one can tell us what they mean. Interpreting dreams is God's business. Joseph replied, go ahead and tell me your dreams. So in Genesis 40 and 9, it says, so the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream first. In my dream, he said, I saw a grapevine in front of me. The vine had three branches that began to bud and blossom, and soon it produced clusters of ripe grapes. I was holding Pharaoh's wine cup in my hand, so I took a cluster of the grapes and squeezed the juice into the cup. Then I placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. This is what the dream means, Joseph said. The three branches represent three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift you up and restore you to your position as the chief cupbearer. And please remember me and do me a favor when things go well for you. That's the first time he asked him for help, right? Mention me to Pharaoh so he might let me out of this place. For I was kidnapped from my homeland, the land of the Hebrews, and now I'm here in prison, but I did nothing to deserve it. Why me, Lord? Right? He's not in jail asking, why me, Lord? But you may find yourself asking, why me, Lord? Why do I have to be in this prison? Why do I have to be at this church? Why do I have to be on this job? Why do I have to be in this business? Why do I have to be in this marriage? Why do I have to be in this place? You may be asking yourself all these things. Why is this you know, happening to me over here? He said, for I was kidnapped from my homeland, the land of the Hebrews, and now I'm here in prison, but I did nothing to deserve it. So you might not have done anything wrong, right? You might not have done anything to deserve being thrown into the cistern, being put in shackles and chains, and being sold off into slavery, being left for dead, and, and people telling others that you were dead. Maybe you did nothing wrong, but in Psalms 105 and 17, it says, 16, he called down famine on the land and cut off all their supplies of food. He sent a man before them. Joseph sold as a slave. They bruised his feet with shackles and placed his neck with irons. I'm reading that to you again for a reason. So here it is when the chief baker saw that Joseph had given the first dream such a positive interpretation. He said to Joseph, so here it is. He heard the vision. Now he thinks he's got something good coming too. Y'all know how people go looking for prophets to get a word, right? Maybe you don't. I don't know. I'm just assuming you do, right? So he said to Joseph, I had a dream too. This is Genesis 40 and 16. In my dream, there were three baskets of white pastries stacked on my head. The top basket contained all kinds of pastries for Pharaoh, but the birds came and ate them from the basket on my head. That does not sound good, right? This is what the dream means, Joseph told him. The three baskets also represent three days. Three days from now, Pharaoh will lift you up and impale your body on a pole. Then birds will come and peck away at your flesh. That could be why he was not remembered when the baker got out of jail, but I don't know. The pastry chef, right? So, Genesis 40 and 20, Pharaoh's birthday came three days later, and he prepared a banquet for all his officials and staff. He summoned his chief cupbearer and chief baker to join the other officials. He then restored the chief cupbearer to his former position so he could again hand Pharaoh his cup. But Pharaoh impaled the chief baker just as Joseph had predicted when he interpreted his dream. Pharaoh's chief cupbearer, however, forgot all about Joseph, never giving him another thought. Have people forgotten about you? Never given you another thought? You've held them up. You've kept them up. You've prayed for them. You've lost sleep over them. You've fasted for them. You've given them money. You've sown into their lives. You've been a blessing to them, but they've forgotten all about you. Glory to God. And you wonder why. I said, because I sent a man before them. Glory to God. He sent, he called down the famine on the land and cut off all their supplies of food. He sent a man before them. Joseph sold as a slave. Insert your name there, right? They bruised his feet with shackles and placed his neck with iron. So let me go to, let me see if this will let me move forward without losing my space. Let's say, 
So, two full years later, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing on the bank of the Nile River. This is Genesis 41. So, two more years, he's in prison, forgotten about. Now, the baker's dead, right? The cupbearer is back in his position, but he didn't give Joseph another thought, right? In his dream, he saw seven fat, healthy cows come up out of the river and begin grazing in the marsh grass. Then he saw seven more cows come up behind them from the Nile, but these were scrawny and thin. We know the story. These cows stood beside the fat cows on the riverbank. Then the scrawny, thin cows ate the seven healthy, fat cows. At this point in the dream, Pharaoh woke up. He fell asleep again and had a second dream. This time he saw seven heads of grain, plump and beautiful, growing on a single stalk. Then seven more heads of grain appeared, but these were shriveled and withered by the east wind. And these thin heads swallowed up the seven plump, well-formed heads. Then Pharaoh woke up again and realized it was a dream. The next morning, Pharaoh was very disturbed by the dream, so he called for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt. When Pharaoh told them his dream, none of them could tell him what they meant. Finally, finally, the king's chief cupbearer spoke up. Today I have been reminded of my failure, he told Pharaoh. At least he took accountability for forgetting about Joseph, right? Some time ago you were angry with the chief baker and me and you imprisoned us in the palace of the captain of the guard. One night the chief baker and I each had a dream and each dream had its own meaning. There was a young Hebrew man with us in the prison who was a slave of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams and he told us what each of our dreams meant and everything happened just as he had predicted. I was restored to my position as cupbearer and the chief baker was executed and impaled on a pole. Pharaoh sent for Joseph at once and he was quickly brought from the prison. After he shaved and changed his clothes, he went in and stood before Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream last night and no one here can tell me what it means, but I've heard that when you hear about a dream, you can interpret it. He said, I sent a man before them. Glory to God. He called down famine on the land and cut off all their supplies of food. He sent a man before them. Joseph sold as a slave. They bruised his feet in shackles and placed his neck in irons. Glory to God. So here it is in Genesis 40 and 16, 41 and 16. It is beyond my power to do this, Joseph replied, but God can tell you what it means and set you at ease. So Pharaoh told Joseph his dream. I'm going to just skip past that because we just read it. And so go down to Genesis 41 and 25. Joseph responded, both of Pharaoh's dreams mean the same thing. God is telling Pharaoh in advance what he is about to do. The seven healthy cows and the seven healthy heads of grain both represent seven years of prosperity. The seven thin scrawny cows that came up later and the seven thin heads of grain withered by the east wind represent seven years of famine. This will happen just as I've described it for God has revealed to Pharaoh in advance what he is about to do. The next seven years will be a period of great prosperity throughout the land of Egypt but afterward there will be seven years of famine so great that all the prosperity will be forgotten in Egypt famine will destroy the land this famine will be so severe that even the memory of the good years will be erased wow as for having two similar dreams it means that these events have been decreed by God and he will soon make them happen therefore Pharaoh should find an intelligent and wise man and put him in charge of the entire land of Egypt then Pharaoh should appoint supervisors over the land and let them collect one-fifth of all the crops during the seven good years he's given him a vision he's given him a plan he's given him a blueprint Joseph is telling Pharaoh this is the, the strategy this is what you need to do I've told you what God is saying and I'm giving you a strategy because he sent a man before them glory to God have them Genesis 41 and 35. Have them gather all the food produced in the good years that are just ahead and bring it to Pharaoh's storehouses. Store it away and guard it so there will be food in the cities, that there will be enough to eat when the seven years of famine come to the land of Egypt. Otherwise, this famine will destroy the land. Joseph's suggestions were well received by Pharaoh and his officials. So Pharaoh asked his officials, can we find anyone else like this man so obviously filled with the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has revealed the meaning of the dreams to you, clearly no one else is as intelligent or wise as you are. You will be in charge of my court. Good God Almighty, right? And all my people will take orders from you. Only I sitting on my throne will have a rank higher than yours. Glory to God. I want to run and do cheetah flips. Joseph was a boy, 17 years old thrown into a cistern because he dreamed dreams that showed his brothers and his family and his mom and dad that they were going to bow down to him for a reason yet to be revealed. Instead of killing him, they sold him into slavery. 
He sat in prison and for an additional time and for an additional two years on top of that was forgotten about and left for dead by his family as far as they know. His father's mourning his death while he rots in a prison. Well, not rot. Sits in a prison, right? All of a sudden he's remembered for his gifts and now his gifts have made room for him in the palace. He's not even experienced. He said you need to hire someone that can do this. You need to hire someone that can go and um, what, let's see what it says again. You need to hire someone that can... Where is it? That will help gather all the food produced in the good years, right? And will store it away and guard it. In addition to that, you need somebody that's going to help you implement the strategy and put it together so that there will be food in the house. That there will be food in Egypt for every city that is in Egypt. And here it is. He said, can you find anyone? But since you have revealed it to God and no one else seems as wise and intelligent as you. Glory to God, I'm not talking about Joseph. No one seems as wise and intelligent as you, my dear Facebook friend, right? Or my dear YouTube friend, because he sent a man before them. Glory to God in Psalms 105, 17 for this purpose. And he was not an experienced man. He was a boy when he went to prison. He was he was out there serving, his, going to see if his brothers um, were okay in the field so he could go back and take word to his father. He was not experienced in running a country where here he has been given the highest rank in the land and the only rank higher than his is Pharaoh himself. Glory to God. It's not about what you know. It's not about your skill set. It's not about what you can do. When God has given you a vision, he will bring it to pass. So let's stop with the woe is me, gloom, despair. Why me, Jesus? Because he said I sent him ahead of him because he sent him ahead of the famine. He sent just, he, uh, let's keep going and I'm going to tell you, okay? But you already know, but if you don't know, let's keep going. Pharaoh said to Joseph in Psalms 41 and 41, I hereby put you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh removed his signet ring from his hand and placed it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in fine linen clothing and hung a gold chain around his neck. Then he had Joseph ride in the chariot reserved for his second in command. Good God Almighty. And whenever Joseph and wherever Joseph went, the command was shouted, kneel down. So Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of all Egypt. Glory to God. And Pharaoh said to him, I am Pharaoh, but no one will lift a hand or foot in the entire land of Egypt without your approval. Glory to God. Right? So let's go down to Genesis 45 and 7. So this is where Joseph reveals his identity to his brothers. And I know I'm skipping ahead. You got to go read it. It's so good, right? But this is where Joseph reveals his identity to his family or to his brothers. For the famine has covered the land these two years, and there will be five more years without plowing or harvesting. Because remember, he predicted, he prophesied seven years according to the word of the Lord. God sent me before you to preserve you as a remnant on the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Glory to God, because in Psalm 105, 17, it said he called down famine on the land and cut off all their supplies of food. He sent a man before them, Joseph, sold as a slave. They bruised his feet with shackles and placed his neck in irons. Yet now he stands as the second in command in Egypt over all of Pharaoh's armies, over every city, the, high, the second position in command with no experience no skill set because he could um he could interpret dreams because he was a man of god glory to god so god has placed you in position and you wonder why do i have to go through the prison why do i have to be left for dead why do i have to go through these things why do i have to be forgotten about it says because god sent me before you to preserve you as a remnant on the earth to save your lives by a great deliverance you are yet there to deliver someone glory to god we are sent here for deliverance we are set here to lead the captives out, right? To set captives free. And so here it is. Therefore, it was not you who sent me here. Oh, good God Almighty. See, here it is. His brothers are feeling bad because they're like, it's our fault you ended up in Egypt. But it was not their fault that he ended up in Egypt. It was by God's hand that the strategy of God and the plan of God worked it such that he used them to do those things. He said, therefore, it was not you who sent me. This is Genesis 45 and 8. But God, who has made me a father to Pharaoh, Lord of all his household and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Good God Almighty, right? For the purposes of going ahead to preserve them as a remnant on the earth. What has God sent you out ahead of these things to do? He's sending you ahead of the famine. He's sending you ahead of lack. He's sending you ahead of loss. What is he sending you out to do? So instead of staying in the, in the, the, the forever going on pity party, right? 
of why me, why me, why me. Ask God, what are you sending me out ahead of? Who are you sending me out ahead of? What am I supposed to do that I will go back? And now you're going to give me this elevated position, not for myself, right? Not an elevated. He never said that God gave was giving them an elevated position above them. He just said, I see you bowing down. Glory to God. But here it is. He revealed to them, God sent me before you to preserve you as a remnant on the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Glory to God. And so we're going to end on that note. I'm Pastor Garlinda Price with Common Ground Ministry. Shout out to my honey buddy, my lamb chop, and shout out to my kids, Miriam and Caleb Price. So anyway, God is so good. I pray you enjoyed the revelation. I know I enjoyed sharing it. So I'm going to go run my errands. We've been on here for 30 minutes. But anyway, good God Almighty, stop whining. What are you in prison for? What are you suffering through? Why have you been left for dead? Ask God, what is the revelation? He is the great deliverer, but God is not going to let you go through those things for nothing. Glory to God. He was removed from prison, called out by Pharaoh, a signet ring placed on his hand, dressed up in an amazing robe. Glory to God and made second in command over all of Egypt. And he even called himself the father of Pharaoh. Glory to God, which technically is their was their natural enemy. But here it is, God saved him for a remnant and basically Pharaoh treated him and put him in a position of what would have been given to someone that had experience. He didn't even have experience. Glory to God, but he had wisdom. And the word of God said, wisdom, she cries out, right? For all that will hear her. Glory to God. I love you. Again, I'm Pastor Garlinda Price and I'll talk to y'all soon. Bye.